do, why don't we go ahead and get started? By way of introduction, my name is Dr. Frederick Gooding Jr., but you can call me Dr. G. I am a professor of critical race studies and media in general. And when I say critical race studies, what that means is that we simply like to take a closer look at what is hidden in plain sight. And so with tonight, with this conversation, what we're going to do is simply take a closer look at the Academy Awards and see what they stand to tell us about African-Americans in society. The name of the book is called Black Oscars and it came out in 2020. And even though it came out in 2020, the pattern that is discussed in the book is something that arguably may be something we may be dealing with for some time to come. But why don't we go ahead and talk a little bit about what is in the book before you make that decision for yourself. So I thought that since we're talking about the movies, it would only make sense that we pattern and stylize our discussion after the structure of a movie or a play. Movies typically have three acts or three parts, right? And so what I'd like to do is first start off with an overview. Now, when we talk about Black Oscars, I think what we I want to first get out the way is even though I mentioned uh, the idea of critical race, uh, a lot of people might think different things when they hear the word critical, right? Uh, I recall learning uh, when I was playing sports as a youth that you should be aware of the coach who has nothing to say. So being critical is not necessarily a bad thing. It means that uh, in, in, you know, in, an individual is interested and is paying attention and is providing feedback, right? Now, there's a difference between constructive criticism, uh, you know, and just critique just for the sake of it. But uh, I want to just get out from the very beginning that a lot of the work that you see here is a product of love for the movies. In fact, everybody loves the movies. Right? And so um, everyone loves the movies, including me. And I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't have a connection uh, to, the, to the medium. After all, it takes a significant amount of time to go through all these movies and to think about them accordingly, right? And so consider yourself lucky as having two of the hottest, uh, well, have, having tickets to the hottest show in town uh, at least this evening. So let's backtrack. The book that we're talking about in, in terms of Black Oscars has a pretty unwieldy uh, subtitle. I believe it goes from Mammy to Mini, comma, what do, after, uh, what do the Academy Awards tell us about African-Americans, question mark. So let's start at the very beginning as far as who is Mammy? Now, Mammy, believe it or not, is the actual name of a significant character in the Hollywood universe. And the reason why is because Mammy is the name of the Academy Award winning role as played by Hattie McDaniel in the 1939 classic, Gone with the Wind. So what is significant about this is that she was the first non-white individual to ever win an Oscar, right? So this is absolutely groundbreaking. And so the question we have though is, what did Hattie McDaniel win the Oscar for? Was it for her compelling acting? Was it for her ability to contort her face and convey emotion? Was it the intonation of her voice? Was it her blocking and spacing on screen? Well, these are matters that we can debate. What we do know is that the character's name is Manny. I don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill, but I do want to take note of that which is subtle and significant, staring at us. So recall, her name is not Scarlett O'Hanson. You see what I did there? Scarlett O'Hanson, comma, the Mammy. Or her name is just Scarlett O'Hanson. And then when you watch the movie, you're able to put two and two together and say, oh, well, she's a, she's a Mammy. She's a, she's, a, she's a maid. No, her name is Mammy. So what's the issue with that? Well, the issue with that is that it depersonalizes the humanity of this individual. Because at that time, when this movie was made in the 1930s, roughly 80% of all Black women were serving as domestics. Is this because they were just naturally talented at it? I don't know. Maybe it's because 
this is the only type of job that many African-American women were able to secure for themselves, right? So that was the difficulty there. And so this idea that she didn't have a name gives us a clue as to how African-Americans were viewed in society. Remember, uh, Rep Butler's character uh, has a name, right? You know, he's not uh, defined by his function, which is gambling, okay? So when we talk about who is many, that's also a very compelling question, right? Um, I just wanna just, just pause for one second just to allow for an individual to enter into the room here. Uh, why don't we go ahead and admit and go from there, okay? So when we talk about um, many, who is many? Well, fascinatingly enough, Minnie is also the name of an Academy Award winning role from a movie that came out in 2011 entitled The Help. So where does this leave us? Well, I think it leaves us with a tantalizing starting point to our conversation. After all, if Black women are receiving awards for playing subjugated maids on screen more than 70 years apart, what does that tell us about the value and visibility of African-Americans in society, right? And so arguably in the 1930s, we can make the argument that society was merely reflecting, the film was reflecting what was going on in society. And so we simply wanna ask similar questions as to well, what's going on in 2011, whereby we're so interested in the name of entertainment, mind you. Remember, we're talking about Academy Awards. This is not the documentary of the year where it was screened in all elementary schools across the land. No, we're talking about a movie made for profit for entertainment purposes, right? And so what's the fascination? over seeing black women playing subjugated figures in 2011. That's a question that I think we need to explore. For when we talk about the Oscars, the Oscars are indeed a big deal. They may not be a big deal to you or me, but I do want to assure you in stating that they are a big deal. Deal. What do I mean by this? Well, the Academy Awards have been going on for 93 years straight, right? This will be the 94th year in 2022. And the Oscars have grown, grown to a point whereby a 30 second ad will run you roughly $3 million, maybe $5 million on the high end. So a lot of people are paying premium dollars for this advertising space. And part of the reason why is because there are so many people watching. The Academy Awards enjoy an international audience that is unparalleled and un unrivaled. I mean, no disrespect to the Golden Globe Awards, but the Oscars are arguably the most watched, televised, just the most valued award event that we have, not just on our country and our soil, but throughout the world. I mean, after all, when was the last time that you lined up to watch um, British Film Awards uh, in your living room? Um, you may not have, but the fact of the matter is, is that many an individual outside the United States of America is indeed uh, taking stock and interest as to what the Academy Awards are doing. So it only behooves us to ask the question, if so many eyes are watching, what is it that people see, particularly when it comes to African-Americans? So what did I miss? What did I miss? Mm. Oh, well, while we're talking about the Oscars, um, I guess we also have to talk about Hollywood. And I think it would be, uh, it would be a mistake if I did not mention one additional detail uh, to add to our conversation here at the very beginning. And that is that while many strides have been made and progress has definitely uh, been uh, in, in the making for many years now, the unfortunate fact is Hollywood did begin 
in an era of racism. Now, what makes me assert such a bold proposition? Well, why don't we just go from the very beginning? Does anyone remember the name of the first mainstream film? It's considered the, the architect of many of the, or the prototype of many of the mainstream movies that we watch today in our films with respect to the silent film era had a certain style, but then the cinematography changed, the, the way angles were, were positioned, the, the, the pacing of cuts. And we all give thanks to this innovative film in terms of technique, uh, Birth of a Nation for pushing us into the present direction that we have right now. And so from a tactical standpoint, it's not uncommon for Birth of a Nation to be shown or displayed in a prominent film school anywhere in the nation, pick, take your pick. Now, what's the issue? Well, judging by your own eyeballs, you can see that, uh, no, this is not a poor uh, man's version of Darth Vader. Uh, this is a KKK uh, member on top of a horse. And so KKK stands for Ku Klux Klan, uh, Band of Brothers um, is the term. And this was a group of jilted started by a group of jilted Confederate soldiers in the aftermath of the Civil War. And uh, essentially, and unfortunately, they continue to wreak havoc and terror on many citizens um, uh, that did not fit their mold. So uh, it's fair to say that the KKK has engaged in acts of domestic terrorism. I mean, it's a, it's a simple fact. So um, in this movie, the KKK are the heroes. They literally ride in on their horses on high towards the end of the movie to save our white damsel in distress. From who? Well, from a black male who has licentious and lascivious, wait, I'm sorry, not a black male. Uh, it would be a white male in blackface. That's who was trying to pursue this white female. She jumps her to her death rather than be ravished by this black brute and the KKK comes in at the end to save the day, right? Uh, Teddy Roosevelt actually screened the film in the White House and called it a flash of white lightning. Uh, excuse me, not Roosevelt, uh, Wilson. And so um, that was then, that was then. But in addition to that, when you look at the first talking picture, it also is mired in this history Right, and the first talking picture is Jazz Singer, came out in 1927. Again, why is this so very important? Well, it's important because I'll talk about the Oscars and the patterns today, but we need to know how Hollywood got started. I mean, the African-American image wasn't born in a vacuum. It, 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 it progressed over time, right? Or so to speak. And so in, in terms of the very first African-American images, I think, it's important to point out that many of them weren't actually of African-Americans. And as you see on your screen here, this is a picture of Al Jolson, a Jewish white male in blackface. And even though um, my Jewish brothers and sisters have absolutely uh, been discriminated against in this country, um, that unfortunately did not stop Mr. Jolson from putting on black cork or uh, uh, a coal to blacken his face and imitate or shoe polish oftentimes and imitate this perverse idea of what an African-American person should look or sound like. And it was often exaggerated motions, uh, poor grammar, um, always uh, in the name of humor. They were called minstrel shows, right? And uh, the jazz singer was the first talking picture that put this all together. And so uh, while I personally may be offended by this, of which I am, uh, blackface is offensive, um, the, it was, absolutely entertaining to those who saw it uh, back in the 19, late 1920s. Um, and so that's how Hollywood began. And, and notice when you look at um, the white around Al Jolson's mouth, that actually uh, is supposed to represent the enlarged size of a black person's lips. And I think that's so very fascinating, interesting seeing how, um, you know, when <sighs> Minstrels first came out, Many people made fun of African Americans um, because of their various features, uh, lip size being one of them. And now I, I just find it so, I just had to make a quick segue. I find it so ironic that in today's society, um, you actually have 
whites who sell the idea of not fat lips or big lips, but full lips, right? I mean, you can actually go to your local uh, plastic surgeon and request the Kylie package, the Kylie Jenner package, right? Um, but yet, when African Americans were being African Americans, it wasn't nearly as attractive. Um, and I would also just like to quickly point out before we move on to the modern day, that um, even though Hollywood started here, we have to ask ourselves to what degree does Hollywood fundamentally change? So in other words, if Hollywood was racist against African Americans, the question is, when did Hollywood stop being racist against African Americans, right? Like when did it like fundamentally just stop making disparaging images that were problematic? I don't have the answer to that question, especially in lieu of more recent images such as Tropic Thunder, where uh, you have, uh, this is Iron Man or Robert Downey Jr. Uh, in blackface, right? So in other words, he purposely darkened his skin to appear like an African-American. And if you watch the movie, he proceeds to talk and act um, out what he believes is how an African-American person talks or acts. And even though it was in the name of parody, um, what's fascinating is it still occurred. And uh, would you believe Speaking of Oscars, Robert Downey Jr. was nominated for an Academy Award for his role in Tropic Thunder. And this is in the modern era after the 2000s, right? So again, going back to our earlier question, if racism were a train, right? Um, and according to the New York Times, uh, you know, Hannah Nicole uh, 1619 project, we can perhaps use the date 1619 as that beginning date of when the train left the station. Right, and 1619 is the documented date by which that a white lion ship with 20 odd Negroes arrived in Jamestown, Virginia. So if, if that's when racism started, when, when did it end? When did Hollywood end? So in order to help answer that question, I've, I've created a couple of rubrics for our analysis that, that should help us and, and as we have this conversation about Oscars today. Um, one of the, the first things I'd like to point out is that um, the monster we face today is a lot more subtle in nature than what it was, right? And so um, what we're looking for now are a reoccurring character patterns that on the surface may appear benign, but in the aggregate contribute to this larger idea of marginalization, okay? And a lot of those ideas you can find expounded upon in the book that hopefully you can find in your local library entitled, You Mean There's Race in My Movie. I'm sorry, uh, I almost forgot. My publisher wants me to recite the title in a different way. Uh, the name of the book that I'm referring to that hopefully can be resourced to you is entitled, You Mean There's Race in My Movie. Right, enough of the horror and suspense. So in terms of our conversation tonight, what we'd like to focus on are the following. I, in my studies, in my research at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences Library um, out in Los Angeles, California, uh, found five consistent strands or trends that I'd like to share with you. Because once we have these in mind, they may help shape a productive conversation as to what do the images that we're seeing, what do they mean, okay? And so what I'd like to do is uh, define these uh, uh, terms and simply walk through them to give you an idea or preview. And then we can we'll put the pieces back on the table and have a discussion about what, what this means. So uh, these are called the five Oscar angles. And the five Oscar angles are inspired by actually the uh, uh, Academy Award statuette itself, right? And the story behind this is when I was doing the research at the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences, I was just being a good Boy Scout and being uh, polite to uh, my librarian because uh, librarians are awesome, right? Librarians are awesome. Um, you know, you should talk to your librarian because they're awesome people. So that's what I did. I talked to this librarian and she was so very awesome. She was like, 
what you're doing is awesome. And I was like, oh, okay, thank you. This is awesome. She's like, this is awesome. And I was like, this is awesome. And she's like, you want to do something awesome? I was like, yes, that would be awesome. And she was like, how would you like to hold a statuette? I was like, that sounds awesome, right? It's an awesome story. All right, so I actually held in my hand an Oscar statuette. And typically when people are holding them up triumphantly after a win, it's, it's kind of hard to see the detail. And so when it was in my hand, I was in, actually able to see, as you all can see in your screen, that there's five circles actually at the base of the statuette. And I asked about that. Uh, I was like, well, well, what are these circles about, right? Um, and, and by the way, the statuette is actually kind of heavy. It's actually kind of heavy. Uh, and so I asked, hey, well, so what's the story behind this? Is there a story or is this a decoration? And, and the answer is no, there is something to it. Um, as with most things we see on screen, as with most things we see on screen, Right? I mean, there's a reason for it, right? Very few things happen by accident on screen, okay? And that's part of our conversation that we're gonna be having here. But uh, she explained that they represent the five original branches that the Academy wanted to honor, okay? Okay, so that's the uh, motivation and inspiration for our Oscar angles. So why don't we go through them in turn and see what they mean? Okay, so the first uh, uh, category here is Black non-American. So, Dr. G, uh, this smells a little xenophobic. What are you saying? Uh, that may be a false whiff that you that you detected there. Let me allow me to explain. Okay, um, I have no problem though with uh, anybody trying to make a living, uh, particularly uh, in the arts. I mean, it's difficult. It's tough. So that's not the issue. The issue is with Hollywood, allow me to explain. So what I found in doing a uh, exhaustive analysis of every single Oscar nomination uh, since the beginning, uh, nearly a fifth of all black Academy Award nominees are black, but not American. So allow me to explain. See, as an African American, uh, what people are really saying when they call me that is they know my skin is darker and I'm visibly identifiable and I might possibly be connected to the African diaspora, right? That's what they're saying. I personally don't know exactly where in Africa, um, there's over 60 countries and it's a huge continent as you may know. And so this idea that, oh, wow, look, there's another black person. Oh, look, there's another black person. Yes, it's true that they all might be black people that you see on the screen and we all might have difficulty catching a cab at 2 a.m. in the morning, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we all necessarily share the same culture. Just like if I was just in Europe a couple of weeks ago and I'm at a cafe and I see a whole bunch of people sitting out, that doesn't mean necessarily mean they're all from the same culture. And in fact, in care with careful listening, I hear, some people talking French at this one table, some people talking German at that one table, just because they all appear white doesn't mean that they all share the same culture, okay? So you can have black people in movies, but they can be from Trinidad and Tobago, or Caribbean Island, or they can be from Nigeria, an African nation. Um, they can be from the UK, or they can actually be from the United States. So the issue with this is that it points out the paucity of opportunity for African-Americans in America, right? Because if you think about it, African-Americans are uniquely dependent upon Hollywood to reflect back to their own image. So if you recall the animated movie, Kung Fu Panda, while it was a hit here in the States, Kung Fu Panda was frowned upon over in China. And the reason why is because it was their national symbol. I mean, I mean can you imagine if uh, there was an animated movie uh, featuring a bumbling, stumbling, overweight and out of shape, a bald eagle. I, I, I don't know. I mean, no one's made that movie yet, but if, if they did make that movie in China and then try to sell it to us here in America, I, I just don't know how much of a hit it would be in terms of people being sensitive about, but that's our, that's our symbol. That's our national bird. Well, a lot of people felt that way in China about Kung Fu Panda. I mean, the panda's national symbol. And so, um, while that was happening with Kung Fu Panda, the, the idea is that 
still many people who are of Chinese descent or people in China, they still have other movies being made by the country of China or by Chinese Americans. In other words, there's an actual Chinese cinema that's independent of Hollywood, right? Um, take Bollywood, it's actually independent of Hollywood, right? I mean, or even like the UK, I mean, they, they make their own movies, BBC, British Broadcasting Channel, they make their own movies independent of Hollywood. But see, with African Americans, um, not quite the same, you know, and, and, and Tyler Perry is just one individual. So, you know, let's not put that pressure on, on him. So what's the point? So the point is that um, when you look at the fact that a fifth of all roles, Academy Award nominating roles go to Blacks who are not American, it just raises the question as to those who are born in America from America, what type of opportunities do they have to uh, break through the arts, let alone get through in the big screen, right? And so um, the last thing I'll say about this, uh, if you're still um, uh, whiffing hints of xenophobia in the air, um, just, I mean, just, you know, to add to your conversation, let's think about the movie Churchill, right? Uh, named for the great British leader, states, statesperson and spokesperson, right? Uh, for some odd reason, they did not find a French individual to play the role of Churchill. He's from the UK, United Kingdom, he's British. For some odd reason, they, they, they just did not find like a German actor to play the role of Churchill. They, just lo and behold, it worked out whereby to play the role of Churchill, they found a British actor to play the role of Churchill, right? I mean, he's a, he's a British star in real life. So they, they ended up, so in other words, when you think about what's happening with um, Americans, um, um, American roles, not quite the same translation is happening. And so there's actually um, more competition for less slots, um, you know, for black roles, when you factor in how wide and, and um, widespread and diverse the African diaspora is. Moving on, crossover. Over a third, so this is significant, over a third of all Black Academy Award nominees are Black movie stars, but not actors. What do I mean? So they will be crossover comedians, crossover sports stars, maybe even crossover television stars or musicians, but not necessarily classically trained. Now, it's not to create a hierarchy again. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm being uppity. All I'm saying is that Denzel Washington is a rare bird indeed. And so what's more common is for movie studios to hedge their bets. So when you put, say, take the Fast and Furious franchise, when you take a, 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 a Cry Reese, excuse me, Ty Reese, and uh, pair him with Ludacris, you're getting a two for one special whereby people in the paying audience recognize who this individual is but at the same time, um, Hollywood has um, been able to save on making the investment in creating a Hollywood star. And so it's easier for them to insert somebody who already has a built-in audience. And so that just raises the bar and makes it all the more difficult for regular people like you and me to break into the business. So I almost need to be like a platinum selling artist in order for Hollywood to look at me and maybe have a chance that, that would improve my chances. So what's fascinating is how, uh, again, this is a larger conversation about who has access to the arts and who has the ability to shape their image. And over a third of all Academy Award nominees, Black Academy Award nominees were not quote unquote, classically trained actors. So with Deja Vu, um, this is important because 40%, uh, significant number of all Academy Award nominees are what I call repeat contenders not offenders, but repeat contenders. So uh, I guess another way to explain it would be like this. May the good Lord help us all if Morgan Freeman, Denzel Washington, and Viola Davis are all riding in the same car and get in an accident. I mean, we, we, we're, I mean we're, we're gonna be in trouble, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's the majority of our Oscar, Black Oscar nominations right there with those three people. 
Uh, and so what we're saying here is it's not as if of the say 77 different nominations, you have 70 different people uh, who are receiving nominations over the years, but you're really talking about a very small group of people who are receiving the same, receiving the same type of recognitions a uh, year in and year out. Again, narrowing the, 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 the pathway for other African-Americans to share their voice, at least in the mainstream movies. But we'll talk a little bit later about Netflix and Hulu and how they're providing additional opportunities. But traditionally, I mean, this is a, that's a relatively new trend, but traditionally, y'all, when you talk about the annals of Academy Awards uh, movies, um, you know, you're, you're talking about uh, not that many different uh, Black actors have been able to participate in this space. And one of my favorites uh, uh, is the gravity of reality. And you see the whopping number, 80%. Um, so the overwhelming majority of all Black Academy Award nominated roles deal with one to two concepts, poverty or racism. I'll repeat, they deal with either racism or poverty, or I'll repeat, they deal with poverty or racism, <laughs> over 80%, right? And so, what, what, so the idea of the gravity of reality is that unfortunately, in real life, uh, many African-Americans struggle um, with access to resources, right? Nothing, you know, nothing to do with intelligence or ability, because uh, clearly people love to see uh, people like me play sports, right, or sing. Um, so the, the ability to be a human being is, is extraordinary. Uh, in fact, uh, anyone listening to my voice right now probably has black music in their phone. So, so you understand the power of black, of, of, you know, of black humanity. But oftentimes in the movie space, African-Americans are limited to this trope of always being hampered by racism or poverty. Right? That's why I call it being uh, grounded by the gravity of reality. And, and in contrast, many of my white brothers and sisters are liberated by what I call the freedom of fantasy. Right, Whether it be I have a remote control uh, and I'm able to pause matters and then manipulate like click, or whether it be I'm in Mordor fighting off uh, you know, elves and, and half demons and Lord of the Rings, to um, a movie like Italian Job. Uh, or, or Ocean's Eleven, that's fantasy as well, where we're going to go in and rob a bank uh, millions of dollars and, and, and live to tell and, and, and laugh about it. That, that's fantasy, right? I mean, I think if even if it went in to the Bellagio and tried to walk out with uh, two chips worth $5 a piece, uh, I'm sure security would be waiting for us, right? It, it wouldn't, uh, I don't think it would be quite a Hollywood ending. So that's the gravity of reality in contrast to the freedom of fantasy. To illustrate the point, I just have a small clip that shows how on a daily basis, my white brothers and sisters are liberated by what I call the freedom of fantasy. Here I the power of imagination. The thrill of adventure. The journey will be electric. The Chevy Bolt. Okay, uh, a couple of things to review really briefly. Uh, so when we talk about fantasy, um, I am a huge fanboy of Star Wars. I, I, you know, when when the Galaxy's Edge opened, I went immediately, like immediately that summer. Right, I, I was there. Okay, uh, my brother uh, lives in Germany. Uh, we're still planning for April twenty twenty three for him, my niece and nephew to come out. I mean, this is serious business, right? I I'm all about Star Wars. But uh, I haven't seen much evidence that suggests that X-Wing fighters are real. Okay, that's A, that's A. I mean, uh, again, maybe they might exist. I just haven't seen much evidence that suggests they're real. So that's, that's A for fantasy. B for fantasy is even if they were real, uh, I am finding it incredulous to believe that you're gonna have an expensive piece of multi-million dollar military equipment. Remember, this is an X-Wing fighter. It's not an X-Wing rider. You don't go to the grocery store in this. You get in it because you're trying to shoot the enemy in space and kill them forever. It's military equipment. I just don't see it flying that close to the ground at that highest speed. I, I just, I'm not seeing that. That's number two. And then thirdly, no disrespect to American-made cars, but is, is, is the... Is, is the car that fast? 
Is, is the car that fast? Okay, so here's the deal, y'all. Um, once I take a little time and actually walk through logically this uh, 15 second clip, we clearly see how it falls apart under the weight of logic. But that's not the point. The point is, hey, you know, we're going to Disney World. This is great. This is awesome. You know, uh, and I have a mom driving the wheel, you know, on top of that. That's, that's you know, this thumbs up. But this is all fantasy. It's fantasy. And we often take for granted how my white brothers and sisters are liberated by the freedom of fantasy. Meanwhile, chances are, if you see someone like me on screen, it's to talk about the hard, weighty stuff of racism and poverty, right? Okay. And along those lines, um, still in the struggle, uh, nearly a quarter of every single Academy Award uh, nominee who's African-American or Black dies before the end of the movie. <laughs> okay, so why don't we take a look. Um, through the 91 years that I studied, right, because we're in 94 now, through the 91 years that I studied, uh, there were 77 total nominations, and these are were your, um, your total of 19 winners over the whole 91 year period, okay? Um, there's actually another winner. I'll, I'll, I'll show you who they are in just a moment. Um, but uh, before I move forward, I mean, just take a look, though. I mean, if you're a movie fan like I am, and a quick scan of many of these faces will we'll, we'll show you how the, the rubric I've laid out is starting to make a lot of sense, right? In terms of just the looks on many of the faces, underscoring that there's some sort of racial trauma taking place, right? I mean, obviously, when you look at, uh, you know, Precious uh, with uh, uh, Monique, uh, you know, third row, third from the left, um, you know, uh, Viola Davis, uh, you know, the fourth row, second from the left, um, you know, this, you know, even uh, uh, Lupita Nyong'o, uh, third row, four, uh, fifth from the left, this idea that, I mean, even just the looks in your faces, I mean, even Denzel Washington, um, you know, first row, fourth from the left, I mean, this is a picture of him getting whipped. <laughs> I mean, here he, uh, the movie's called Glory, where it, it, it talks about the fifth, fourth regiment, um, the all black regiment that died, um, you know, during the civil war. Um, so you take up arms to help a country that's still segregated, and yet you're still being whipped for trying to get boots, right? I mean, so, so this idea of racial trauma is still wrapped up into these narratives, right? Um, and, um, you know, when I talk about this idea of freedom of fantasy versus uh, uh, being liberated uh, by, you know, gravity of reality, I think what's also fascinating is the uh, trend that so many of these African-American movies that prominently feature African-American protagonists, they're, they're only doing so because they're built around extraordinary, true-to-life African-Americans, right? So in other words, when you look at uh, Glory, uh, top row, uh, first row, fourth from the left, or even Ray, second row, fourth from the left, uh, Last King of Scotland, third row, first from the left, even Dream Girls, third row, second from the left, uh, 12 Years a Slave, third row, fifth from the left, um, or even uh, Green Book, fourth, fourth row, third from the left. Think about how so many of these movies are based upon true to life events, right? And so while on one level, it's awesome that we're creating a space to create these images about African-Americans who were extraordinary in real life. At the same time, it also takes African-Americans out of that fantasy space I was talking about. So maybe when you talk about hot tub time machine, like what's the point of that? I mean, just bros, just being silly. I mean, it's like random, I mean, the humor, but, but yeah, so when, whenever you see an African-American, it has to be this true to life, extraordinary story typically of one who was able to overcome poverty and or racism to, to get to where they were. Um, it, it just can't be people just in space, right? And again, um, we're starting to see some of that being challenged. When you look at a television show on NBC, such as Grand Crew, it's about um, African-American friends who are centered around wine drinking. And the humor there is kind of random. It, it kind of, you know, just like friends is kind of random, but that's the point, um, I think, to show that African-Americans can also be human in different ways as well, as opposed to being superhuman or else, right? So, so what? Well, 
this conversation is absolutely relevant as we move forward in time because still we have a misrepresentation issue at play. Um, even though not by much, whites are still overrepresented in terms of the total amount of actors um, that are registered with the Screen Actors Guild. And if you have any uh, ideas about appearing in front of a camera for pay, then you must join the Screen Actors Guild. There's no questions about it, okay? And then when you look at the Writers Guild of America, these are the people responsible for creating the scripts that, that we follow. Um, here's where we start to see some separation here as far as um, whites having um, a disproportionate amount of influence on the stories that we see, okay? And then when you factor in the Directors Guild of America, the contrast is even more stark, right? As far as um, there being so few directors, because remember that 2% refers to everybody else. And that 2% includes uh, directors of commercials, television shows, films, and feature films in the summer. So if you really think about the number of African-American directors who have the opportunity to produce those large tentpole movies that, that gets that Oscar buzz um, all summer long, very far and few between, right? And again, this is no news to, to me or to anyone in Hollywood. Um, you know, these diversity reports come out on a fairly frequent basis and many individuals know that the statistical data is um, definitely something that needs to be improved upon. Speaking of statistical data, I would like to share with you some more numbers um, when we're looking at the final Oscar analysis. And when you look at the total number of nominees over the years, it's been absolutely paltry, right? It's been absolutely paltry as far as the number of African-Americans who um, have been actually nominated in the first place, right? And then when we're looking at the number of African-Americans who actually won, um, you know, I think it's, um, I mean, it's still telling that uh, I, you know, have only seen Halle Berry win for Best Actress and, and, and that's it, right? I mean, that's it. Like, that's, that's it. Like, she's the only African-American female to win for Best Actress, right? I mean, it's just, just a fascinating concept that, that, that the numbers can be what they are. It's amazing as it is alarming, especially when you look at the fact that African-Americans comprise not just 13% of the population as far as the numbers not being representative in that respect, but also African-Americans have had a disproportionate influence on American mainstream culture. When you think about our movies, I mean, even think about the memes that are in your phone right now. I mean, we've had a disproportionate influence, but yet when it comes to the actual awards, that's where we're far and few between, okay? And so along those lines, I promised you that I would tell you about the 20th uh, Academy Award winner uh, because there's a 20th Black Academy Award winner and that 20th Academy Award goes to, drum roll, Daniel Kaluuya. Um, and notice, there are a couple of rubric uh, boxes that he checks, right? So Daniel Kaluuya is Black, not American. He's from the UK, right? And he's playing the American freedom fighter, Fred Hampton, right? And again, God bless Daniel Kaluuya. God bless Daniel Kaluuya. That, okay, I want to be very clear about this. God bless Daniel Kaluuya. All I'm saying is that, you mean to tell me walking the streets of Hollywood, we, we can't, find a, can't find a brother who's, who's willing to play uh, uh, Fred Hampton on the screen, uh, just in terms of you know, providing additional opportunity. I, I think it's, it's still an issue that's ongoing. It's a live issue, right? And not only that, but gravity of reality, right? Poverty and racism, check, check, right? Uh, that's what the Black Panthers were fighting for and against. And then lastly, uh, still in the struggle. Uh, he dies before the end of the movie, right? Um, he's shot in his bed and miraculously, his pregnant wife was untouched. Uh, that, that's another story for another time. But, but yeah, um, you know, so it's awesome, it's great. You know, we, we're adding to the number, but um, I, I think what's fascinating is the question for us is how much has truly changed over time? Because uh, you all may remember um, that um, there was this campaign in 2015 called hashtag Oscars so white. And part of that campaign, the awareness was around the fact that there were zero, no Academy Award nominations at all out of the 
four main actor categories. So you have best actor, best actress, best supporting actor, best supporting actress. So out of the 20 total nominations, not a single one had featured an African-American in uh, 2015. So the hashtag Oscars to white came about. Um, my premise is that while counting numbers is effective, it's only effective up to a certain point. So we need the numbers, we, we have to use numbers. But my strong suggestion is that in addition to the quantity, we should also evaluate the quality, right? And that's where my rubric, the five Oscar angles come into play as far as us being able to evaluate, not just, oh, Louis Gossett Jr., he was a great guy, he was born in such and such. No, but the actual role on screen, like what was the quality of the actual role on screen, right? Because even if still, if we're going by numbers, uh, hashtag Oscar so white in 2015, uh, we had zero noms and therefore zero wins. But you know what's so fascinating is despite all the debates, all the ink that was spilled and poured and writing about this topic, um, <laughs> despite the innovations, I mean, in fact, the Academy is um, led by a black female, um, despite the, the policy changes, what's fascinating is how a mere half decade later in 2020, there's only one African-American nomination and zero wins, right? Zero wins. Um, last year, there were uh, five total nominations and one win, right? Uh, and that was Daniel Kaluuya. Uh, you want to know the nomination though for 2020? It was um, Cynthia Erivo. Uh, and uh, I, just, I want you to see her face. Uh, and that was for her role in Harriet. Again, similar pattern here in terms of Black Not American. Here she's playing freedom, American freedom fighter, Harriet Tubman, I mean, distinctly an American character who literally crossed the border of America. I mean, it'd be, that, that was, it was, she was like, she's defined by her Americanness, if you would, right? I mean, the whole point was for her to cross. Okay, but bottom line is they, they found Cynthia as the best actress, God bless Cynthia, um, and kudos to her for a nomination, but again, this just speaks to the paucity of opportunity of, of other African-American uh, women uh, who would love, I'm sure, the opportunity to portray uh, an American heroine. So uh, when we look at what has changed over time from the first African-American uh, win in 1939, Gawk to win, to more recent times, we simply have to ask ourselves, what has fundamentally or systemically changed with respect to the quality of African-American images, right? I mean, one of the distinct differences obviously is that one is in black and white and one is in color, but, it, but in addition to that, how have matters changed for African-Americans, right? And what I'm suggesting uh, as a result of the, the qualitative uh, analysis of the data that, uh, in many ways, the monster we face is like a remodeled train. So the old racism was loud, lumbering. It was something you could hear and see from a mile away. It was pollutive. That's the old racism. This overt, ugly, obvious, and offensive, right? I mean, who wants to see a decaying body, gently swaying in the, in the breeze. I mean, the, 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 the stench and the odor. I mean, who, who wants to see that, right? Okay, you know, mutilated, you know, the ears cut off and things that, just to teach this boy a lesson. Who, who wants to see that, right? So now, um, you know, we're talking about a system that showcases African-American imagery, but maybe still not in, the optimal light or the greatest possible light. It, it still appears that the majority of African-American roles are fraught with these issues of racial friction, right? And, and, and not um, nearly matching up, um, you know, to the same degree with uh, many of the white characters that, that we see on a consistent basis in terms of um, what it is that they're able to do. And also to what extent that um, uh, that movies featuring white characters are embraced by audiences, right? I mean, just think about the difference between Princess and the Frog and Frozen. You can make the argument that the songs were different, the uh, actual um, 
uh, visual cinematography was different in terms of cell animation versus computer animation. But I think while those are factors, another factor to consider is to what degree race played a factor, right? I mean, and that's the more difficult question, but for some odd reason, Princess and the Frog just did not capture the hearts and minds of America quite the way Frozen did, right? Or quite the way Harry Potter did. Um, and maybe Dora is, is the closest example I can think of of a non-white youthful character that's been popular, but still not at the level of Harry Potter or, or Elsa in Frozen. And so in summary, what, what we have is, I think we have an opportunity to use the Academy Awards as another tool, right? Um, you all have been watching movies for such a long time. I would encourage you to take another look you know, and, and, and take a closer look at what you're watching um, you know, with some of these ideas in mind, looking not just at the quantity. Oh, look, what's he talking about? I see two black people on screen, but the quality. When these African-Americans are on your screen or these black Americans are on your screen, what are they doing? What is their positionality? Do they have, uh-oh, uh-oh, power and control? To what degree do we see inside their lives, inside their minds, interiority, I think is another question. So I, I still think it's just a fascinating opportunity for us to use movies as a tool to learn more about that which is hidden in plain sight. Because for me, Dr. G, um, one place where we are all equal is at the box office. Hollywood will take all of our money just the same. But even though we all pay the same price of admission, it appears to me that it is people of color, Blacks in particular, who disproportionately bear the cost of omission. Will Hollywood ever move from the track, you know, going along with the train analogy, will it ever move off this track? Only time will tell. My name is Dr. Frederick Gooding Jr. AKA Dr. G reminding you that now that you've had this Mac Oscars experience, may you never see the Oscars the same way again. Thank you.